alone. An issue that if 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 a, if a program is being made about Radio Caroline, the history of and its effect, the events of August '89, the invasion by the British and Dutch authorities of Caroline, the smashing of all the equipment, I mean, tearing everything out they could tear out, and, and and you know this whole act cannot be ignored. It, you can't ignore it. Tonight, Radio Caroline is silent. The Ross Revenge she broadcasts from marooned in international waters off Essex, a Dutch tug alongside. There was drama as the Dutch went aboard, but Caroline kept broadcasting. Right, this could be the end. We wish you a lot of love. We've been uh, here since 1964, Easter Sunday, 1964. And hopefully someday, Radio Caroline will be back. In fact, I feel sure that we will. Please keep listening. Loving awareness is free. Easter Saturday, March the 28th, Radio Caroline's first broadcast descended on Britain like a bolt from the blue. It had been a well-kept secret. Radio Caroline, four and a half miles off Felixstowe, was the first of the pirate ships to beam unlicensed pop music over British shores. We found the men behind this scheme in the office of that glossy magazine, Queen, just around the corner from the law courts. Jocelyn Stevens, editor-in-chief of Queen magazine, is joint managing director. Chris Moore is the program controller of Radio Caroline. And Ian Ross, sales executive. Ronan O'Reilly, the originator of Radio Caroline, begins at the beginning. Um, well, it, 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 uh, I suppose in a way it came out of the, um, the, the 60s rock and roll era, because at the time I was... Uh, I was I was managing a number of bands, and uh, there was a, a very big block against uh, independent record companies. Uh, there was only EMI and Decca at the time. And a particular artist I had was Georgie Fame. And Georgie um, had this um, problem that, that, that at that time that he was very much a rhythm and bluesy, jazz, black orientated, you know, were, were his, uh, his roots. And of course, at that time, it was Cliff Richard and the Shadows and Frank Ifield, and that was the, the establishment. Every record starts at the desk of one of the company's artist and recording managers. In this case, Nori Paramore. Who's he thinking about? Ruby Murray, Craig Douglas, The Shadows, Cliff Richard, Michael Holliday? No, it's Helen Shapiro. I have loved you more each day, walking back to happiness. Oh, yeah, yeah. Said goodbye to loneliness. Oh, yeah. And then we went into independent uh, recording, which was, which was something that didn't happen in those days either. And having done that, I remember uh, taking the acetate belonged to BBC, who had, I think, an hour a week, Alan Freeman on a Saturday afternoon. Greetings, Pop Pickers. It's Pick of the Pops. <laughs> One 
the new chart climbers, and for the first time ever at number 19 is America's Norma Taniga. And then there was a few hours of Luxembourg at night, which was a bit intermittent signal-wise. And if you weren't with your mind, Decker, you couldn't get on Luxembourg. And at that moment, I'd said to them, I'd said, well, look, all I wanted to do was to sort of break Georgie fame to get him off the ground. And I've had to record the guy, I've had to start a record label, and now it looks like we have to start a radio station. And it, it, and it literally, it literally was that kind of moment. Let the sun shine in, come on right away. I first met Ronan Arahili in the Kenya coffee bar in the King's Road. So, that, you know, the, I, I suppose the Kenya was a sort of a hangover from the late 50s, when there was a sort of cosmopolitan King's Road cowboy who, who were sort of generally known as hustlers. They generally had a mid-Atlantic accent. They generally wore dark glasses. They generally were photographers, or at least possessed a Hasselblad or a Pentax or both. And they'd sit around at the key deer, you know, sort of watching their cappuccinos go cold and, and kind of looking at each other and uh, looking out of the window and, you know, wondering what was going to happen. You know, something might happen. Pink champagne, stole my love from me. And when Rona came in, he wasn't everything Chris had told me about being cool, he wasn't, you know. His clothes were awful and he, he was very sort of, hello, how are you, what's happened, baby? You know, and he'd sort of look at everybody and say, how's it going, you know? And, you know, it was the most terrible thing you could possibly say. You know, those kind of guys would have a complete nervous breakdown if they were really asked to say how it was going. Ian was a friend of mine who was kind of a young boy about town. Um, who had a father who he had quite rich parents, and his father seemed to worked in the city of London and specialized in financing ideas. And so here, here I have a friend whose father is a specialist in this in, spe in financing ideas, and here I have another friend who has an idea that wants some finance. That was the other thing that was happening that was a big influence for, for me, anyway. You know, the Irish-American president, you know, after the, the sort of grey 50s, and, and this breaking of the mold had happened at the beginning of the 60s. And I think the Kennedy thing was the first big one of those, you know? And there was that whole war baby, you know, all the war babies were on the move, as it were. And, and they had a certain amount of money, and they wanted something. I think when Ronan met me in the, in the Kenya, he wanted to know if I really, I mean, genuinely wanted to know if I was going to be a, a, the right kind of, you know, if I could dig it and handle it and w had soul. You know, soul was the thing then. Ray Charles. We'd actually say Ray Charles, baby, Ray Charles. You know, and it was a, a, a way of saying something, you know, you'd actually say Ray Charles. <laughs> well, now, oh, Mary Ann. The 60s were a time when you didn't... I mean, sort of spe uh, specialists went... went uh, didn't seem to be necessary. All sorts of people got together, as is well known, to form a band who, uh, quite separately, weren't very good musicians and somehow it worked together, and people started record companies who didn't know anything about record companies. Everything, everything, everything could start. Starting Caroline was was just another. Start. But it, it is important to remember that actually all it is suddenly as if the, the sort of slate had been wiped clean, and and new ideas were it. Ronan was one of many people who used to visit my building, and I was talking to many people by this time about. Uh, my idea for a radio on a ship because I was looking for backers and he was full of praise. He's always full of praise when he wants something. And uh, he offered immediately to take me over to meet his father who was a rich man in uh, Ireland. And I was very keen to meet possible backers 
So I flew with him, oh, within a day or two to uh, Ireland, and his father took me in his car, beautiful car, to the border where he had control of a port which was no longer in use, but which would be very uh, convenient for surreptitiously uh, erecting a new radio mast on, on the ship when we had it. Part of the plot, which I didn't know when I first met him and met his father, was that the father would get possession of the key to the whole thing, which was a copy of the QC's opinion as to why it could be legal. And we innocently, I gave him a copy, and he must have given it to Ronan, who then was able to run around showing this to his backers. But this time he was armed with a stack of papers like this, and sort of and sort of sat and sat like this. It was much more, you know, a small survey on the south coast. I remember his exact words: a small survey on the south coast has been carried out, and we have established the fact that if a ship, and, and this was it, you know, this was the pitch. A ship was parked off the coast in the sea, three miles outside, with a transmitter on it. The whole fucking country would tune in and turn on, and that's it. But, but there can be no copyright on this idea. I mean, there have been 11 commercial radio stations on ships before, and, and it's, it's idiotic to think that it's any single person's idea. It's not an invention. This, this is a fact. What happens is, is that Renan took this fact and put it into operation. And um, do you know anybody that would be interested in that, do you think? You know, put, maybe put a few bob into it and so on. <laughs> I said, yes, I certainly can. Think of old daddy. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we went from here. By now, I suppose we'd met in the Kenya at uh, 2 o'clock, and it was now 5 o'clock or whatever. And um, I had the MG, I had an MGB. We, we, we didn't pause. We, we, he grabbed the papers, we got in the car, the three of us, and we went straight to Hazelmere, which is where my father lived. There was a, a collection of people who had money. I think to a certain degree they had made a lot. These guys, they were in their, you know, 60s, a lot of them. And they, they had made a lot of money. And I think it wasn't all it had been made out to be, the making of the money. And they were quite bored by where they were at that, you know, a certain amount of them. And this, this project uh, was quite exciting. And, uh, I mean, my father just simply just went for it right away. And I think he said he had a few friends. He'd see if he had a few friends, he would see if they fancied a, a punt, you know, a flutter. It was a, it was a flutter for a few people who he knew. The most main person, apart from my father, was Jocelyn Stevens. I think he was the next biggest of these vaguely paradoxically establishment sort of figures who in fact weren't, in some strange way, weren't really establishment figures, you know, who had sort of something that they wanted to change. So I think Jocelyn certainly did you know there was a sort of schoolboy part of jocelyn i think that saw it in a kind of boy's own level as we were outside the law um whose law we were in and we made we were in our end so did a signature on a piece of paper uh, a piece of radio can paper but did it have any Authority. So that led us to um, living in a way that was was. Uh, um, um, I mean, we'd, most of the business was in cash. Quite a lot of it, um, therefore, went astray, inevitably. Chris Moore had been in the Merchant Navy for about half an hour at one point. He was a purser on a, <laughs> a cruise liner. And so he became in charge of everything to do with nautical matters and had to go to Copenhagen or somewhere with about 10,000 quid in a suitcase and buy a ship, which he did. Anyway, the next day, I flew to Dallas to, to a place called Continental Electronics, who were the transmitter company. And on the way over, magazines on the plane and, and opened this magazine. It was this headline, Caroline Smiles and Disrupts Government. And it was a 
a series of pictures with um, Jack Kennedy. I mean, the story was there were various powerful people waiting to have some major international conference or something, and he's playing with his daughter. And I just, that, that was it. I mean, I just saw Caroline, and I thought, that's the name, Radio Caroline. And literally, it was, it was named to sort of, you know, link in with that Kennedy, the idealism, the, the, the hope, the possibility of things were going to be different. At this time, we're indeed pleased to have with us in our studios Mr. John F. Kennedy, son of Ambassador and Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy, who is known to his friends as Jack Kennedy. Suddenly, here was a ship in Greenor Harbor, which wasn't exactly known for anything kind of controversial, with this huge, great 190-foot mast on it, 186 or something. Uh, that stirred a lot, and that was the biggest sort of crisis moment because a local newspaper got into it and they were told that it was for um, uh, searching for sponges. <laughs> I remember that was the story we gave the local. And they did a piece on it, you know, about this, that this aerial sort of that was up there <laughs> went down through the boat, you know, and sort of had an eye on it. They went around looking for sponge. <laughs> the Irish who by that time got the idea that Caroline was something was anti-English and therefore were wholly pro uh, and have a wonderful sense of humour anyway. They thought this was terrific. So, and I remember one day I was, I was going about, I had a, we were so uh, absolutely bedeviled with the need to be secret that we had all these code names and I'd forgotten uh, uh, what Greenall was called. I intentionally did, because I dreaded sort of blurting it out in one, in one sleep, so to speak. And uh, I suddenly think, I can't remember what the hell this place is called. I can't remember the code name. Nobody else says anything. I can't remember the telephone number, which I'd sort of eat, written on a piece of paper and swallowed. Really. And suddenly the man, I was standing at the airport, Dublin, and the man came up to me and said, uh, you wouldn't be after the visiting the sponge fishing vessel in Greenall. I said, quiet, quiet. You know. But there was another surprise to come. A second pirate radio ship with a different group of backers was nearing completion. This was Radio Atlanta. Alan Crawford, 42-year-old Australian music publisher, is the boss behind this outfit. I couldn't find another port in which to um, fit out my ship, the Mi Amigo, and um, had to be using his father's port as originally agreed and we were tied up against his ship, which was bigger, uh, and all the time getting a kind of Irish mafia treatment of uh, things disappearing and so on. You could never put your finger on who was doing what, but we were being delayed all the time. I mean, a comedy in a way. <laughs> two-way family favourites. <laughs> that the BBC should remain the sole broadcaster on national sound radio, virtually unchanged. Desert Island Discs. The day of the launch, and I remember it was a, an Easter Saturday, and we had this restaurant in Fleet Street hired for the day. And uh, the public relations had laid on all the press and TV, and all the boys were all there in the restaurant. And I must have picked the only restaurant in London that, that had put in some very modern heating, so that the, all this copper was in the ceiling and the floor and the, and the walls, copper sheets with heating in it. And of course, copper doesn't let in radio signals. So when we went to tune in the test, coming up to 12, the test broadcast that was going on, which was Ray Charles, incidentally, because the one thing that at no time during the day in England would you hear Ray Charles. So we figured if we use Ray Charles when we find it. And of course, then I went to tune the, 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 the desperately trying to tune the set in. To, to give credibility to the whole thing, we, we couldn't get it because of that reason, because of the reason of the copper sheeting. 
And so it was then this moment with all these journalists all sort of starting to think, What's, what are we all here for? And I suddenly had the idea, boom, take the set and go out into the street. <laughs> you know, that, that this could be it, right? So I took the set, and as I went out into the street, quite a few of them started to follow. And it ended up then with all these journalists and people all coming out of the restaurant, all into the street. And sure enough, as soon as we got out there, bang, in, in came Ray. <laughs> Hello and happy Easter to all of you. This is Christopher Moore with the first record program on Radio Caroline. The first record is by the Rolling Stones, and I'd like to play it for all of the people who work to put the station on the air, and particularly for Ronan. I think it no sad if that's on. I think I heard about it from an older kid at, at school who was saying, you won't believe this, there's, a radio, there's radio stations like the ones they have in the States where they play, they play music all the time. And, you know, I was accustomed to getting uh, half an hour here or an hour there or sitting through an entire horrible, boring, uh, light programme comedy show just to hear one guest appearance by a group halfway through. And went home and sort of got the radio and took it up to my room and closed the door and found this thing and suddenly there was uh, Martha and the Vandellas dancing in the street and I thought, yes, take me there. What Pirate Radio did was to take the music that London hipsters were listening to, all those rare imported records, whether in the early days they were soul and R&B records, and a bit later on, weird acidy records from, uh, psych from psychedelic California. They took, the, they took those records out of an elite audience and put them out there where, where you know, spotty little bozos like me could pick up on them and have our minds twisted by them. <laughs> I've got a theory, in fact I checked this, this theory out, that I wanted to find out if I had a new band, totally unknown with its first record, and if this record was going to go on to sell a million, I'd like to find out who bought the first one. Because he's pretty smart, you know, it's easy, so I'm buying the next Beatles record, but somebody's totally unknown. Um, and I checked that out. What I used to do is just go to the factory where we, <coughs> we used to ship the records out, and the orders used to come in. And the orders for this particular unknown record by this unknown band were always coming from little villages, little small places, up normally in the north of England, away from big centres. And that's where Radio Caroline first captured its audience, is it got the people who had nothing else to do but listen to radio. They're the ones with the ears, really, because they're the ones that are listening. It's a hard world to get a break again. London was always the last to get onto a hit record. It'd be in the top ten before the Londoners would be buying it. On April the 17th, four weeks after the Caroline set sail, the Mi Amiga slipped away from Greenall. Eight days later at the Waldorf Hotel in London, the Radio Atlanta group proudly announced that the Mi Amigo had anchored three and a half miles southeast of Frinton-on-Sea and not many miles from the Caroline. Roy Mason, Labour MP for Barnsley, questioned Mr Bevin several times in the House of Commons about pirate radio ships. The vacillation of Her Majesty's Government has now allowed Radio Caroline to become established, is now allowing Radio Atlanta to start her test transmissions, an audience is being built up, they will be to some extent annoyed, and consequently the 
government are building up trouble for themselves. Anyone who ever loved could look at me. Within a matter of weeks, though, financial necessity drove Atlanta and Caroline into alliance. We then had a strange negotiation between, between the two parties, which ended up in us owning the Mi Amiga. So Caroline then had two stations. So we then sent the, uh, the uh, Queen Frederica, Caroline, the original Caroline, round to the Isle of Man and anchored there. Left to Mi Amiga, where it is based on the same wave length. We had a, a national station really reaching, not including far north of Scotland, but every other part of the United Kingdom. And uh, an audience of near 22 million on a Sunday morning, um, which made us the biggest commercial station in history. Carolina, the sound of a nation! Man, that's groovy. You're tuned to Radio Caroline on 199, your all-day music station. How long have you been on board yourself? Long time, long time. Um, how long have I been on board? Five, uh, six weeks. Six weeks. It seems to me, and I'm not being unkind, you could do with a rest. Um, yes, I could do with a rest. <laughs> but feeling a little bit neurotic, are you? Well, a little bit, yes. You know, I'm smoking about 60 of these things a day. And, um, but it's, you know, it's all happening. It's great to be in the middle of it all. What don't you like about it? don't I like about it? Um, I don't think I... I don't like not getting enough sleep, but apart from that, it's fine. Binders Fresh! Play Caroline Cash Casino with Binders and be in line for big cash prizes. To get this whole thing rolling, we needed to get the advertising agencies, the big clients, wanting to do business with us. And there was nothing kind of firm that they could sort of get hold of. Six Chesterville Gardens, which was Caroline House. It was ab absolutely enormous. There was something like seven floors. The, the thing that I liked about it was that it had this sort of church-like exterior, very establishment looking. But once, once you got through the front door of this building, all of that disappeared. Uh, one of the funniest things I can ever remember about him was, uh, God, what was she called? There was an American film star, and it may have been, was it Maureen Swanson or something like that? Gloria, Gloria Swanson. Yeah, who was, who was ch president of, of uh, Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola or something like that. And she, she'd come to see us about an advertising campaign that was going to, you know, would have revolutionized our revenues. And in order to give her the insecurity treatment, she was sort of kept waiting in the, in the lobby with all these kind of dolly birds and Mick Jagger and people like that for about two hours. And then she was shown in and he got a bottle of, of Pepsi in front of JFK. He had this huge bust of JFK next to him. And it had a straw coming out of it into his mouth. And he said, as soon as she walked in, he said, that's the scene, baby, that's the scene. And she just, you know immediately quit the building. It was Joan Crawford, that story, I've decided. You know, the Pepsi-Cola, I'm sure, was Joan Crawford. And, I, and when I think about it, he'd got the wrong kind of cola coming up into JFK's mouth. It was Coca-Cola. That, that, was, that was what was... That was what... Uh... Hello, this is it. This is the room. The L-shaped room where Ronan presided over the airways from that... Over there in that corner was where the L-shaped desk with the bust of JFK on the thing. This is, this is amazing. This is the room. This is, this is the... And this is the L. We had that... This was the entire... I mean, this was the entire room was Ronan's office. If you can imagine. I don't know what this was all about. And it was carpeted in, in sea Irish... Dublin Bay snot green carpet, which I mean, I was probably the last person before whoever this artist was to, to, to decorate this room. I redecorated personally this entire building, and this was the most important room in the building, and, uh, and I was then fired by the board of directors for phenomenal <laughs> overexpenditure. <laughs> but I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but that chandelier rings a bell. I had hundreds of people. I had tapes of people who wanted to be disc jockeys. I had people hanging around in the hallway trying to get in to see me. 
I mean, there were always, and all the time we were in Chesterfield Gardens, there were thousands of people trying to bang on all the doors to get in. We had studios in the basement and testing people out, see if they could do the job or not. And our standards weren't that high. <laughs> I mean, if, if our standards included them not earning that much money, being prepared to spend months out in the middle of nowhere, getting seasick, and delivering a, a reasonable level of, of programming. And that was about it. And some of them fell by the wayside, and some, some of them became household names. First of all, I met a guy called Chris Moore, who I went into his office, and he was standing on his head throwing darts at a dartboard, which was unusual. He was the program director. Um, I did the tape. He, he said, that's quite good. He said, do it again, uh, which I did. And he said, uh, would you like to come back at lunchtime? And I came back, and he said, when can you start on the ship? So I said, well, when would you like me? So he said, well, how about tomorrow? So I said, well, could I make it the day after, which I did. And he took me out there, and that's how I ended up at uh, Radio Caroline South. Piracy. That's what's happening here with the connivance of almost every teenager in southeast England at any rate. We're bound for Radio Caroline, the pirate ship that for over a year has given pop music to something like 20 million listeners, as their advertising sales staff claim. Sometimes you, you would, people would be reasonably popular and seem to be reasonably good at it, but at a certain point, megalomania would set in and that thing would go to their head and they decided they needed more money and they wanted to, to come ashore and become superstars, etc. And they'd have little mutinies and all kinds of trouble. And some of them were impossible, and I would fire them. And then along would come Ronan or somebody else and rehire them. And suddenly I'd find I had this, you know, I just fired somebody, and th two days later I had the same guy. You know, and th there he was back on the firm again. I think there were about 90 or 95 disc jockeys that were fired uh, during the time Radio Caroline was on the air. We had a scroll of honor, and everybody was fired. We jotted their name down. Uh, I was never fired by Radio Caroline, one of the very few radio stations I wasn't fired from. Uh, the reason for that was I was hired by Ronan O'Reilly and Alan Crawford, who was the other side, uh, I was hired as a singer by him. So whenever one got more control of the other, in other words, if Alan Crawford uh, got control, he would always sack Ronan O'Reilly's disc jockeys and vice versa. And I was always in the middle. So I, I got on well with both of them. I was very lucky. Culturally, I wouldn't have jived too well with Radio Atlanta. That was the problem, purely cultural, nothing personal. I mean, he, you know, this chap, Alan Crawford, used to want to do cover versions of everything. They thought that the sort of music that we were playing, that, that, that they couldn't sing in tune, that was their point of view. Last night I said these words to my girl. We ended up with a system of, it was like a railway station with uh, trombone players and violin players arriving at such a minute and going, and we were doing one hit copy every 23 minutes. Why do I always have to say love? My favourite singer of, of them all was a man called Ross McManus, father of Elvis Costello who was Joe Loss's main vocalist, and he used to always be there recording for me. And uh, whenever we did Elvis uh, Presley's numbers, he was magnificent and better than Presley. Presley often used to sing off key. I don't know why he's such a worldwide success, because he was not very good, in my opinion. <laughs> so I kept on getting these strange cover versions of records, sort of Can't Buy Me Love by The Three Curtains, or. So, all these terrible cover versions of records, which I suppose he had a right to have played, but I wasn't going to play them, so I threw them out the porthole, um, which didn't, um, didn't exactly um, befriend me to him, but um, the station was sounding the better as a result. <laughs> I was uh, listening to Radio Caroline, there was somebody broadcasting. Mr. Ben, they said, you're a young man with uh, young children. 
uh, why do you want to stop the pirates? And the phone rang just over there, and it was the Prime Minister. He'd been listening to Radio Caroline. He said, have you heard that broadcast? So I said, yes, I have Prime Minister Harold, or whatever I called him. So it was part of an attack upon a very, very conservative society. Tony Benn was the Postmaster General. And I don't think we thought of him as Tony Benn then. I think we thought of him as <coughs> Anthony Wedgwood Benn. And he'd been Lord Stansgate just about five minutes before that, you know. So he, he made a pretty severe social manoeuvre in the 60s. Whether it was in order to be swinging or not, I'm not quite sure. But he swung into the Labour Party from the higher reaches of the aristocracy and started to hound the hell out of us, you know. The government may pronounce soon on the future of radio in Britain. Mr. Wedgwood Ben, the Postmaster General, has already pronounced on the pirates. They're stealing the copyright and paying no money for it. They're playing records that musicians have recorded and giving them no money for it. They're endangering the ship-to-shore radio, and there's a real risk that distress at sea might not be reported because of the inadequate fumbling handling of equipment. The pirates are a menace, and I don't believe at all that uh, the public wouldn't support action to enforce the law in the interests of all these people whom I've mentioned, quite aside from interference in other countries. Life aboard the ocean and radio waves certainly has its attractions despite postmaster generals. It was a postmaster general, Mr Reginald Bevins, under the last Conservative government, who made the prediction that if the government didn't act against pot pirates, the coasts of Britain would soon be ringed by an armada of pot pirate ships. Well, it looks as if the pot pirates will be left alone and are making money. My great fear was that Raynham was going to get into politics, which, which was inevitable, every part of his home, yeah, and, and uh, and we were going to make some political statement or attack or defend, whatever it is. And um, Ren had this uh, enchanting belief that one could do a deal with anybody. And I can plainly remember these Anglo-Irish dinners that Ronan used to get up. And Harold Wilson used to be the guest of honour. And we used to have them here in the Carlton Tower. And I remember, and he was... He, you know, he, he, we used to send him messages from Bobby Kennedy. Ronan used to, Ronan used to. Get, we used to get these broadcasts. We used to get these telephone links with Senator Robert Kennedy, giving us messages to the youth of Britain. <laughs> and then Ronan used to take the tapes and take them along to Number Ten and give them to Mr. To Mr. Wilson. You know, the, a message from the youth of Britain. You know, and, and I think Harold Wilson got pretty keen on the whole idea of the youth of Britain. Rona was very good at getting over this sort of, uh, this, this mystical idea of Radio Caroline, you know, uh, as like the destiny of Great Britain was involved in Radio Caroline and that it had this mi mission to fulfill. And he used to refer to Caroline as the lady. And when journalists used to go out there and they'd notice that suddenly around the Caroline ship, around the Mi Amigo, that the seas would suddenly be calm, you know. And I mean, reality was because Caroline was anchored over a sandbank purposely for a calmer anchorage. But Ronan would uh, be there and he'd say, oh, because that's the calming influence of the lady there, you see. And Ronan was very much in, into the idea, I mean, 1967, which for me was the heyday of Caroline, was, was the summer of love. And Ronan got well into the idea of uh, that we were beaming out love. There was a, an incredible battle between, you know, the business accountancy world and the freedom-loving, you know, let's enjoy it, and, and the fact that we're enjoying it, the ship will be enjoying it, the, the audience will enjoy it. You know, the whole thing will go through to the audience. Unfortunately, I must say this, the other side of the 60s, which was the anti-Vietnam War movement, the challenge to established ideas, were never reflected on, on commercial radio or pirate radio. They just continued to pump out the music, and in a way, the establishment came to like the pirates, because they offered what I think the establishment realized they had to concede, unlimited pop culture and sexual liberation as a way of diverting and defusing the pressure for social change.
we got this building, it was fun. Uh, because we'd got it, and it was such a wonderful, ridiculous building, you know. And it was so absolutely marvellously unnecessary to have a building of this size, you know. Because, I mean, when Radio London came along, they had one room which you could have fitted ten of in this, just the boardroom, you know. The attempts to try and put some, get some sort of control over the thing, of a logical kind, did not succeed. Because you couldn't really have a logical conversation with Ronan of that kind. You couldn't sit down with Ronan and say, look, A, B, C, D, E, you know, like those sort of chaps like to do. They used to try it every week. They used to sit here at this table or whatever, and they used to say to Ronan, listen, listen, let's get a bit of logic in there. And, but you couldn't. You couldn't. The blarney, the whole thing of Ronan was too, was too intense, you know. He'd say, well, you know, and he'd make you feel, including whole groups of people like that, that they didn't really understand something that was going on, some mystical... Thing that was going on which was beyond their comprehension but what they'd figured was that we were losing money you know like a sieve and, and they were right <laughs> so one day there just wasn't any <laughs> and so phil solomon was the contender put in 50 grand and he knew how to recoup it you know i had a record company music publishing companies we ran an artist agency the money that I put in went in with the proviso that I became joint managing director of the company. I remember Roland was a dreamer. He had wonderful ideas, um, but I knew straight away he was never a businessman. And my real concern was if I was going to put my hard-earned money into it, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to go down the drain. I wanted to protect it. When Phil Solomons finally took over and gutted the thing, I was very quickly removed. I was one of the first to go in the, in the, in the night of the long knives. Right. And after that, after that, all we played was The Bachelors, you know. I wonder why you keep me away. Charmaine. My Charmaine. My Charmaine. My Charmaine. I wonder when the They didn't like a lot of the records that we made but they still went into the charts. The Bachelors had 17 hits in a row. They were very middle of the road. They're very, very strong artists. They do a lovely performance. <laughs> to be very honest with you, I wouldn't have gone into it unless I had control of the playlist in order to play my own record. He did restore order, I think, to an extent. But for all the reasons of, of, of the peculiarity of the thing, uh, formally and informally, there was never going to be, it was never going to be an ordered situation. I think Renan wanted an ordered situation. I mean, he, he uh, and probably that would have made it rather dull radio. It was never dull. I got a letter yesterday and I opened it up and I read this letter and it was from an old lady, a very old lady, and she was on about the marine defences bill, you see. She said, my dear young man, she said, would you believe it must be at least 49 years since I committed an offence with a marine? <laughs> <laughs> Here they are, the happiest criminals in town. <laughs> By that time, we were very much an international station, and we had an international, a pan-European identity. And the part of the law that affected us, as we saw it, was the part that was going to make it illegal for British advertisers. I mean, the part that was effective going to make it illegal for British advertisers to use Caroline. So we figured that it would be tough to continue. But as you know, we continued and survived. This is Radio City, your swinging tower of power. This is Radio Caroline. It is now 12 midnight. Uh, we want to say welcome to the new phase of broadcasting from Caroline. I want you to remember something. That is, a station that belongs to you and is right cannot ever be taken away from you. Dale, what are you doing there? I'm, uh, I'm looking out the porthole window. It really is amazing to see all those cars out there and to know that we're not alone in this, this our most important <laughs> moment. It's tremendous. Of course we're not alone, you I've just been outside and all the, you know, the lights are flashing across the water and it really is a tremendous sight to see, it really is. Let's say a couple of thank yous now. Uh, Robbie and myself would like to thank our leader, Mr. Ronan O'Reilly and Mr. Philip Solomon, all who work for Radio Caroline to make it possible for us to sit here and speak to you now. Also to thank the many, many people who have been with Caroline.
Well, there we end broadcasting in the light programme, not just for today, but uh, as it seems forever. The light programme, that is, well, as it's known now, is closing down. But in only a few hours' time, the BBC with Paul Hollingdale will open up on 247 metres and 1500 metres and VHF. That's at half past five. And then at seven o'clock on 247 metres, Tony Blackburn will open and swing into our new Radio 1 network. Ten seconds to go before Radio 1, Tony Blackburn, and Radio 2, Paul Hollingdale, stand by for switching, get tuned to Radio 1 or 2, 5, 4, 3, Radio 2, Radio 1, go. The voice of Radio 1, just for fun, music, too much. And good morning everyone, welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1. you can learn a great deal about the start of Radio 1 just by looking at the Radio Times. For a start, there's this wonderful dolly bird with Radio 1 all over a flipping skirt there, introducing the swinging new radio service. Well, it was probably fairly swinging, but I'm not so sure that it was very new. You see, if you turn to the last Monday of the light programme before Radio 1 started, what have you got at 1 o'clock lunchtime? Monday, Monday, in big letters, with the Ray McVeigh band and his singers, introduced by Dave Cash. And what happened the first Monday after Radio 1 had started? This wonderful revolution had taken place. One o'clock, this time it says, Dave Cash presents Monday, Monday, with Ray McVeigh and his singers. You see, you've got exactly the same old light programme. So don't forget, although everybody says, oh, of course, we all know Radio 1 was launched by that thrusting young pirate uh, Tony Blackburn, of course, playing the pops right at the start of the day. The second programme on the air was Junior Choice with Nelly the Elephant and the Runaway Train, introduced, I see, by Leslie Crowther of Cracker Jack. I think both the government and the BBC had realised that there was a young audience coming up in the 60s that simply weren't listening to the good old BBC anymore. They were used to all this piratical pop that was coming out. I think the government probably said, look, we can get rid of these cowboys, but if we do, we're going to have egg on a face. Who's going to vote for us at the next election? You know, because this is a popular thing. We'll get rid of it, you replace it. <laughs> I think Radio 1 and the BBC misjudged what it was all about, frankly, at the time. You see, kids who listened to the Pirates were used to hearing music for the first time, rather like you turn on a tap, you know what's going to come out. It's not going to be cocoa one day, it's going to be water. You get water out of a tap. They knew when they got home, they turned it on and the old pop singles would be coming out. I'm afraid we had too much of a hangover from the light programme. When Radio 1 started, it still had one foot in the light programme and one foot in the present, as you might say. I always remember on that very first Saturday at, uh, I think about the half past 12 news, Emperor Roscoe was doing all that uptight, out of sight stuff on Radio 1 and it's news time. And the announcer came on and said, and now on Radio 1, it's 12.30, here is the news in English. <laughs> Last month, when the new act came into force, O'Reilly moved his head office to Amsterdam. He also started branches in Paris and New York and changed the name to Caroline International. Caroline International. The station with the happy difference. Makes you feel good all over. During that time, we didn't have a lot of advertisers because they were getting a bit afraid at that stage. So we depended on record companies and music companies. And we began a system by which we were, would allow them to present their records to us and we would charge them so much a week for playing them. So we used to get a playlist then of about uh, eight records an hour that we had to play. Uh, and the Radio Caroline took money for playing them. And that really used to piss me off. And I used to have huge rows with uh, uh, Robbie Dale, who's the DJ, who said, we've got to do it, Johnny. It's the only way we're going to stay on the air. We've got to play this shit, you know, because this is what's bringing the money in to, to keep it going. But I just felt that that was, 
after having had the freedom of playing whatever record you thought was the right record to play at any particular time, to suddenly play some of the awful stuff. I mean, if somebody puts out a good record, you don't have to pay anybody to play it. In 68, we were in a pretty rough state because all we had was the revenue from the records, and it wasn't really enough. The boat needed a fortune spending on it. It was really held together with sticking plaster in those days, and I wouldn't want it to be on this myself. And the tragedy of it was, for me, that struggling with 24-hour trips to Holland, being sick the whole time, wanting to throw myself off the boat because I never felt so ill in all my life. Um, but I had to keep going because I wanted to keep it going. I didn't want it to die, you know, that suddenly, because of the financial situation, because the bills weren't paid to the people who were supplying the crew and the food and that, the Caroline just disappeared. One morning, March the 2nd, 1969, crews turned up at 5 a.m. on Dutch tugs, cut the anchor chain and just towed us into Amsterdam. And that was the end of it. I remember in 1973, uh, there had been continuing reports, particularly in the music press, that, that Radio Caroline was going to return. And uh, sure enough, in, in 1973, quite early in the year, I, I seem to remember, it, it did return under the guise of becoming an offshore radio museum. It had fooled the authorities in Holland, and in darkness, I think they slipped anchor, and <clears throat> the ship which had been sitting on the bottom of the harbour at some point started broadcasting. In the mid-70s, one of the first things that I resolved on getting to London, getting to Fleet Street, was that I'd like to sort of probe this mystery, this enigma of Radio Caroline, which had come back against all the odds. I'd assume that in order to, to get to Radio Caroline to do anything on the ship, uh, I also had to get to Ronan O'Reilly. So the curious thing was, here, here I was in Fleet Street working for the London Evening Standard with its wealth of cuttings and a huge con uh, contacts book, but nowhere could I find anything that would lead me to Ronan O'Reilly. So I had no starting point apart from going to the Radio Caroline road shows and winning the confidence of the the disc jockeys who ran the road shows, who obviously had links with the station and ultimately getting their confidence. And I was told that I would receive a call from a man who would call himself Bobby Kennedy and that this would be Ronan O'Reilly. And the curious thing was, having got him on the phone and it having taken so long to get to the stage, I then couldn't get him off the phone. And we talked for about two and a half hours. We are not pirates because we, uh, on, on, in, in strict legal terms, we did not sign any 1948 Copenhagen plan. We did not agree totally not to broaden it. completely giving two people what they feel they want. Nothing to do with what I feel or what a government obligation of a license. Uh, immediately, there's, there's a, an imprisonment. Point B is that you're in somehow or other, Caroline, is something they don't control. I think that's that uh, my phone is being tapped. Everybody uh, seems to tend to, a lot of the time, get into a particular ship or non-ship. Well, I'm really sorry to tell you that due to the severe con weather conditions and also to the fact that we're shoving quite a lot of water, we're closing down and the crew are at the stage leaving the ship. Uh, obviously, we There's an to awful lot of the here. intrigue and drama and excitement, I mean, for me. I mean, I like living dangerously. So Obviously, the BBC uh, World Service is one of the larger pirates because, I mean, there are an enormous number of countries that do not wish their broadcast to be received. There is some <laughs> twisted and bitter thing that exists within the establishment machine. 
they hold the vendetta. The events of August 89, the invasion by the British and Dutch authorities of Caroline, the smashing of all the equipment, this whole act, cannot Tonight, be ignored. Radio Caroline is silent. The Ross Revenge she broadcasts from marooned in international waters off Essex, a Dutch tug alongside. Also alongside, a ship chartered by the British government. The Dutch said Caroline had to be silenced because it was interfering with legal frequencies and maritime emergency services. And they also denied claims that they had forced their way on deck. Tonight, the Ross Revenge is still at her familiar anchorage, most of her crew still on board, promising that no one has heard the last from Radio Caroline. There is now a very big Radio Caroline story, which I think may sadly mean the end of it, because the Department of Trade has now introduced legislation which would make legal what they did illegally then. They've extended British jurisdiction beyond our 12-mile limit to say that in the cases of unlicensed offshore marine broadcasting, the ship can be boarded, uh, seized, impounded, the, the crew can be arrested uh, whilst the ship is in international waters. Is it just the three of you at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Are you running on the petrol generator? The amendments to the 67 Act have created an offence, the enforcement of which is virtually unprecedented. So if you had Radio Caroline, as she is, moored in the high seas, and alongside her you had a Liberian ship packed to the gunnels with crack, the Secretary of State could authorise anybody he liked to board Radio Caroline and strip it of all its equipment, but there is nothing he could do without reference to the flag state of the vessel in respect of the crag. So one might say that Caroline has become establishment enemy number one. We are in discussion, uh, discussing with a number of third world governments, the possibility of, of them making use of Radio Caroline, you know, to um, see in what way we could help them uh, put, you know, some points of view that they have uh, to to um, parts of the world that maybe haven't uh, received those messages before. Radio Caroline can be anywhere, right? 